But with the fall of Nineveh, national confidence was probably boosted, and then things quickly turned sour. With the death of Josiah in 609, which was a terrible shock, you have Judah lying trapped, as it were, between two great powers, Egypt in the southwest, Babylon in the northeast. And in 605, as I said, Babylon managed to defeat Egypt and reduce Judah to the status of a tributary vassal under the king Jehoiachim. King Jehoiakim rebels, and in response, the Babylonians lay siege to Jerusalem. There will be two sieges of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, just as we've had two sieges earlier. Two sieges, one in 597, one in 587, both under Nebuchadnezzar. He lays siege to Jerusalem in 597, it doesn't destroy Jerusalem, he kills the, the king, takes the king's son into captivity um, in Babylon, and installs a puppet king. I'm still under the assumption that things could be kept under control. So the puppet king, Zedekiah, is on the throne, but he also decides to rebel and assert Judah's independence against the Babylonians, so Nebuchadnezzar returns, and this is in 587. And now the city is in fact captured, the sanctuary is completely destroyed, and the bulk of the population is exiled. And this is what brings to end nearly 400 years of, independent, of an independent Hebrew nation. The book of Habakkuk, was written during this period, sort of 600 to the destruction, somewhere in those years. That's the period in which the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem twice. And Habakkuk is another unusual prophetic book. It doesn't contain prophecies so much as it contains philosophical musings on God's behavior. And we're going to see this increasing now as we move into the next section of the Bible when we complete the prophetic section. We'll be encountering writings of very different genres, and some of them do contain these philosophical musings on God's conduct. Habakkuk 1 and 2 are a kind of poetic dialogue between the prophet and Yahweh. And the prophet complains bitterly about God's inaction. Verses 2 and 3 of the first chapter. How long, O Lord, shall I cry out and you not listen? Shall I shout to you violence and you not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you look upon wrong? Raiding and violence are before me. Strife continues and contention goes on. And skipping down to verses 13 and 14, you whose eyes are too pure to look upon evil, who cannot countenance wrongdoing, why do you countenance treachery and stand by idle while the one in the wrong devours the one in the right? You have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler. So God responds to these charges by saying that the Babylonians are the instruments of his justice, even though they ascribe their might and their success to their gods rather than to Yahweh. Now, we've already seen in other books the idea that conquering nation is, is serving as the instrument of God's punishment. But Habakkuk is a little bit unusual because he doesn't couch this idea in the larger argument that Judah deserves this catastrophic punishment. 